Hey everybody, it's Jessica DeMassa with WTF Health. What's the future of health? I am talking to the who's who of health tech and healthcare innovation. And today we are checking in on what is going on with the telehealth market with this insider right here, Roy Schoenberg, the co-CEO and president of Amwell. Roy, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. Hey Jessica, good to see you again. Always, Next time always a pleasure. Yeah, right. I know. Um, so let's jump in, Roy. I'd love to get an update from you on what you think is going on as far as the telehealth market. I feel like there's been a lot of buzz about this, especially, you know, as things are opening back up after, well, still in COVID, but things are opening up more. A lot of health systems and hospitals um, and health plans have made their investment in Omnichannel over the last two years. When you and I have talked, it's like you've marked this shift from healthcare product to healthcare infrastructure. I mean, farther back than most, I feel like you were right, spot on in terms of identifying that as being a major trend. But I'd love to hear what your thoughts are now. So, I mean, give me a sense of, of what's going on in your world. Right, in one minute, right, to make it yeah. interesting. Oh, yeah, um, and, yeah a soundbite oh, yeah, would be great. <laughs> sure. So I think that the, uh, you know, what we talked about then were, were telehealth is becoming more of an infrastructure than, than a product for two people to talk over glass. I think that is definitely happening, but I think it is really that we're beginning to understand that that's actually just the tip of the iceberg. Um, the organizations that we work with now understand that distributing healthcare over technology is part of their future. It doesn't matter actually if you're a payer or you're a health system or you even a provider practice or Medicare, you understand that some part of the healthcare that you're facilitating is going to happen over channels that people are very comfortable with technology, email, text messaging, whatever, video and all of that kind of stuff. But with that now comes a much bigger transformation, which is for the organizations that we just mentioned to not only consider that they can do their old business using new channels, they're now beginning the conversation, hang on, if we can do it through new channels, does that change our business model? Which is the, the whatever, the tail wagging the dog, whatever you wanna, <laughs> you wanna call it. But you know, it, it's, it's interesting that 15 years ago, we were talking about permissibility of telehealth. Then right around COVID, we got to the point that, okay, it's kosher, we're gonna do a lot of healthcare through telehealth. And now this technology is considered as a change agent for how healthcare is actually arriving at the hands of its patients. There's a lot of different examples, but I'll just be brief about it. Yeah. A lot of health systems who are beginning to take risk, and a lot of them are, are taking risk, are beginning to look at those technologies as a better way to envelope the patients that are going home after they get discharged, um, which essentially allows them to, to monitor them at home and so on. And health plans that historically had nothing to do with care delivery, they were just writing the check for it, are now having a huge appetite for becoming care providers for a lot of different reasons. And they figured that one of the easiest way for them to do so, to get presence in care provision, is gonna be by distributing providers over technology, because that gives them much larger wingspan. So long story short, I think that the sentiment of a year ago was, was real, was right, but there's a much bigger story that follows that canary in the coal mine. Okay. Do you think, I mean, I re remember about a year ago, you had said to me that you had predicted that telehealth and that technology would be um, almost as like mission critical, I think is the wor words you used to describe it, mission critical as an EMR in terms of like the way that healthcare organizations do business. Do you think that we've hit that or have we even surpassed that based on what you've just said? Well, you know, I think I think it's hard to surpass the criticality of an EHR for a lot of organizations. If it shuts down, they shut down. Um, but the one thing that I would say is it, this has definitely happened because the best the best way that I that we experience it is that when our customers are becoming infinitely more demanding in asking us to demonstrate the security stack of our system, the, uh, the redundancy of our system, the load balancing of our systems, the command and control capabilities, the administration capabilities, the, the level of supervision and oversight that our system has 24 seven you know, across the board. These are things that historically, when things were, were a novelty, yeah, it was nice to have, but you know, nobody really signed up for that or was willing to pay for it. 
Now organizations are saying that is a requirement and that is probably, and those requirements come with a, with a dollar sticker price. When people are willing to pay a lot for that, you know it's mission critical. There you go. All right, I'm curious to hear about Converge. Let's get an update there sure. because, yeah, I, I mean, this has been getting a lot of buzz, very, very positive buzz. And it's like the, the push into this infrastructure play that you really at Amwell have led all along. I mean, this is like the signature product for that. So give us an update on what's happening with Converge. Well, it's converging. So the, I think the bottom line, Converge is, is an enormous undertaking uh, in the sense that we're actually trying, trying to squeeze 15 years of, of American well and all of the companies that we acquired along the way, Align, Conversa, Avisia, and, and, and others, Silver Cloud and so on, into a completely new platform in about 18 months and allow that platform to integrate with all of the new mission critical systems as we just talked about that are part of the DNA of the organizations we serve. So it's a completely different animal. Um, I'll, I'll spare you the, the, the general story, but there's kind of three different big steps for Converge. There's yeah. the core, interactive core, then there is the provider side integration, which is all the EHR integrations and all that kind of stuff. And then the third stage is the consumer facing, independent consumer facing side, which is where the pairs come in. We're two thirds of the way out and now looking over the next couple of months to have the last part of it roll into the market. It's working great for the first two parts. We're not done yet. Still a lot that, that is going on, but we expect for the whole power of this battle station to be out uh, this year. I love that battle station. I like it. It's a good battle station. Yeah. I mean, you're like no fighting question. the good fight here. Mission critical battle station. I'm like. <laughs> this is not us. This is, what, this is what's happening around us. We're just kind of tagging along for the, for the party here. No, I, I <laughs> it's a good party to be part of right now. I want to um, I want to ask specifically about Converse and Silver Cloud about that that acquisition there because that was like a that was a world colliding kind of moment for me because it was like you know two two other digital health companies very familiar with Converse obviously a digital front door um, very integrated into hospital systems and Silver Cloud mental health um, yep. bringing bringing that out and and that was such a compliment to Aligned Telehealth which you guys acquired earlier you know providing. Yep. Psych. So I'd love to hear how things are going with the integration of, of those two businesses. And I mean, you had mentioned it briefly, you know, as you were talking about Converge, but what have you been learning? I mean, and you can take them one at a time if you'd like. I mean, maybe start with Conversa. Yeah, so I'll say, you know, they, they seem to be different companies, but at least the reason why we made the acquisition is because they really are similar and completely aligned with the way that we see the future. We believe that now that the door has opened on people getting healthcare through technology really allows us to put in the notion of how will automated interaction with patients going to serve? How will that be part of the fabric that the clinician can prescribe to follow and manage a patient over time? Some of it is going to be with them or with their staff, but some of it is going to be through a lot of technologies that are going to interact automatically. Um, and in that sense, Conversa is really good at doing this for medical conditions, and Silver Cloud is very good doing this for behavioral health. I'll spare you the, the, the nooks and crannies, but boy, oh boy, are we happy that we made those acquisitions. I bet. Uh, not only because the integration is working really, really well, and we've had our you know histories. We all know how companies, when they integrate, it's not. This one's, these ones are working really, really well. Um, and the second thing is that um, it, it is becoming more apparent that the Kool-Aid that we were kind of internally drinking when we decided to make those acquisitions is now shared by others. People understand, even though it rubs people the wrong way, people understand that the introduction of automation into any business actually has a good chance of moving the needle on cost. We haven't invented this. This is true in every other industry. <laughs> now, in healthcare, automation rubs you the wrong way. It's like, oh, I don't want to be automatically cared for. Right. Uh, but this is actually not what we're doing, right? A lot of people resent the notion of automation because they think that automation is going to be applied to essentially second-guess clinicians. It would be replacement of clinician discretion. That is entirely not what we're doing. We're using automation to allow the clinician to specify what needs to happen between when they hang up with the patient 
and when they see the patient again. What needs to hover around the patient and assist them along the way and potentially escalate them back into live care if things are not going the right way. Um, I'll be the first one to say, I think that here too, we are at the very tip of the iceberg. I think that we've, you know, we've integrated most of Conversa already into Converge. Silver Cloud is coming into the fold, you know, right after that, exactly in the same model. So we flush the pipes on that. But I think what those infrastructures can do in Converge, we are at 2% okay. of where we're going to be. It is, awesome. it is mind boggling how much automation can change favorably the experience of patients. So I'm curious on that as far as expansion then for you guys and like what kind of what's next like as you're as you're building this you know command center this this infrastructure yes. you know I mean with that with that acquisition of you know the double acquisition of Converse and Silver Cloud it's like you added in there a lot of you know expanding that tech side of the platform right adding new technologies to what you already had I mean you've also have a history of adding care delivery I mean do you do you head into care delivery more or like I even with Converse it's like that whole automation digital front door piece of things that navigation kind of piece I feel like that that could be an avenue that you go down so I mean when you're looking ahead you know what do you what do you have your eye on in terms of what's next as far as building out further Amwell. So I'll say something that is not exactly the answer you, you, you maybe thought I would say, but what we're looking forward to first is our customers. Okay. So we have a fairly decent footprint in the market, both on the delivery side and the pair side. We're not throwing development dollars just for the purpose of developing something new and shiny, even though I'd love to do that. But this is these pieces of the puzzle are coming together. And now is the time for them to serve our customers in a way that gives them a competitive advantage in the market. And that's exactly what we're hoping to see, what we're seeing on the first two elements of Converge and the third one coming in. Um, and that will allow our customers, not our technology, but our customers to offer services into the market utilizing our technology and their infrastructure that are novel. And I would just say this, and, and we, we cannot speak on behalf of our customers, we shouldn't speak on behalf of the customers, but I can tell you that automation, which is one part that we talked about, are capabilities that change the customer experience with the brands that we serve. On the pair side, the notion that they can begin to offer virtual primary care um, which is, you know, a big part of the conversation, especially post COVID by everybody, but that becoming a reality is a huge change that we're seeing in front of us. And then comes the part where these technologies plug in to the existing supply of healthcare and livens it up rather than trying to continue to create novelties that are going to take 10 years to adopt. It's time for these things to now be plugged in into the existing infrastructure and dramatically change both consumer, patient, and provider experience. And that is what's next around the corner. I mean, it, to hear you say that, it almost seems like your customers, I mean, and you had mentioned, you know, the significant footprint you have, like 55 plus different health plans, 2,000 hospitals, 91,000 providers, like a, a lot of a lot of input there. Lot, yeah. Do you feel like your customers, because I think this was like the, the issue maybe a couple of years ago is that that, that customer base, generally speaking, had a difficult time figuring out how to use telehealth and what to use it for. Talk to me a little bit about like, I mean, it almost sounds like, and you said this at the beginning, you know, they're starting to rebuild their revenue model around telehealth. It, it, just it, it, say a little bit more about how that customer, I guess, like their demands and what they're asking for, how that has changed as a result of the pandemic. Like, do they know what they're looking for now? Or like they coming to you with ideas as opposed to the other way around, like here, we've got this great tech, figure out how to plug it in. But I mean, like, what are you seeing in terms of that? If you were to categorize that change in thinking in that customer base? I'll give you a really, really simple example. Um, when prior to COVID, when all of our legacy platforms and a lot of the products of telehealth that are out there, there are products that are consumer oriented, urgent care, pairs, employers, I don't want to name the other guy or whatever it is, but they're oriented around patient acquired, you know, telehealth transactions. And then there are solutions that are all provider oriented that are follow-up scheduled visits. Some of them are independent. Some of them live inside an Epic or whatever it is. 
And for the most part, these are very different products. Well, now the challenge is most of the pairs are buying provider services. It's just a fact, especially the yeah. large ones. So when pairs are now thinking about buying telehealth, the requirement is not only that you can plug urgent care and some behavioral health into it and maybe nutrition services or childcare into it. They say, well, we want our telehealth infrastructure as a pair to know how clinicians work. So suddenly the products that used to be built for clinicians in health systems are what the pairs want to buy. On the flip side, the health systems are saying, well, we want to be available in larger territories, we want to digitalize products, clinical products that we have that are very good, whether they're second opinion or specialty care or whatever it is. We want to take risk for our patients. We actually have a little health plan that we're nurturing and putting that in. So we need to offer urgent care and behavioral health and all that kind of stuff. And oh, by the way, have you heard that there's a conversation on Capitol Hill talking about removal of state licensure? Boom, boom, boom. Which means <laughs> that now those health systems can play nationally. So they want products for telehealth that historically just the national pairs wanted. So these guys are looking for these guys' products. These guys are looking for the other guys' products. What a good point to be in a platform that converges both and allows everybody of them, everybody to play with the toolbox freely. Put on top of it, the fact that Converge is a federated system so everybody's living on the same switchboard. It's not an installation for this guy and an installation for the other guy. That means that when you begin to productize your services, supply and demand, pairs and provider organization can actually buy and sell to one another. It's a marketplace. Yeah. So a ticket into this reality is now becoming a consideration that most organizations are saying, if I'm putting out an RFP for telehealth, it has to include those capabilities. That's hard to do. Yeah, absolutely. No, and I, I mean, that is such a sea change from where we were even this. just like a year ago. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, you know, yeah. and I gotta, I've, I've gotta ask you real quick because you, you brought up Capital Health. What are, you, what are you hearing? What are you hearing about state licensure? What are you hearing about reimbursement? What are you hearing? Give us a, a quick little <sighs> gossip sesh on what's going on. So look, we, we, we know there was an extension, right? For the omnibus, we know that all of that kind of stuff happened. Frankly, the extension in itself, you know, people are kind of raising their eyebrows and saying, okay, well, so what's going to five month give us? It's a five month extension. But the truth behind it is really re the recognition that we've got to put a framework to embrace how telehealth is being utilized in, in, in care delivery, in healthcare, for Medicare, for Medicaid, for, you know, everything for, for federal employees, I mean, all of that kind of stuff. And the five months extension is really coming with the guidance to HHS and to CMS to figure it out, you know, to give them a little bit more time to say, okay, stop that nonsense about originating site. We know this is an originating site. Okay, it's called a phone. Exactly. It's an originating site. And, and, and it's not only the patient, the clinician is on it as well, and, and so on. So I think that there is an extension of time, but more than the number of months allowed, it's the recognition by the, by the regulators that we got to write the cookbooks again. Yeah. I believe it's going to take them a little bit more than five months. The government hasn't always been very speedy to do stuff. Uh, but the fact that they are embracing that they need to do this is, is actually very, very encouraging. The state licensure piece, uh, I'm, I, I applaud the secretary you know, of HHS for, for bringing this up. I think this is inevitable. I mean, we're... Maybe that's not the right word to use, but we're idiots to actually have so much healthcare all over the country and carve arbitrary fences inside our own home to prevent the healthcare from going to where it's needed. I don't know what other metaphor I can come up with, but we have built our own electric fences around us so that we cannot get healthcare. Maybe we should rethink this. Maybe. <laughs> I love that. Right. I think that's brilliant. 
All right, last thing for you. I do want to pick your brain on the um, the health tech market, generally speaking. So, I mean, we've all watched. Well, I mean, I've got to ask, Roy. Come on. I mean, you're this. You, yeah. you know, you're. I'm. I'm sure you're watching those public markets, and I'm mean, sure you're watching the private markets too. So, I mean, we've seen. I mean, an incredible amount of money go into companies that are privately. Um, privately funded. We've seen what happened to a lot of the companies that went public over the last two years. So, yep. I mean, give us a, give me your take. Like, what do you think about this health tech market? I mean, is it gonna is it gonna bounce back up to where it was? Is it yeah. you know? I mean, give yeah. Okay, tell me. <laughs> yeah, because right now the 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 multiples that health tech companies, including Amwell, are being are being traded on is is unheard of. It's re, it's it's ridiculous. And eventually, there's going to be some normalization. Companies don't get traded at multiple of one or two. It just doesn't, doesn't last. I think we're still weighed down by a misunderstanding of the market on what is the purpose of specifically the kind of health tech that we are involved in. It is still perceived that this was a way to overcome social distancing and people getting locked up and now that it's open up well who needs it the people that are inside the healthcare uh, reality understand that it has crossed the point of no return that everybody now understands that a good chunk of healthcare is actually going to travel over those channels and but but that is not the layman understanding of telehealth people still think that oh it's the convenience thing that allows me to quickly see a doctor on the phone, but if I can go to my PCP now and the office is open, I wouldn't need it. Um, th that, is, that is still the misunderstanding that's weighing on it. I think it's tactical. I think it's gonna go away. Mm -hmm. I actually think that um, part of the extension, you know, the, the, that the CMS is taking and everything else, these are kind of indications of how foundational these technologies are going to become. Um, we are, you know, for us, I, I would say, I'm not saying that we don't care about the stock price, but we're very lucky in the sense that, you know, we took the company public, we're extremely well financed for the next forever. So we're not running into the market to raise capital. It doesn't really affect us in, in that sense. Um, but I think that this is, uh, I think this is a trough. I think this will, will normalize. Okay. I'm happy to hear you say that. I'm encouraged by that. I mean, I, and I, 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 yeah, full disclosure, I, I, I agree with you. <laughs> so I'm I happy to hear it. Yeah. Yeah, good. All right, Roy. Well, we will have to check in with you again. You know, hear how things are going down the road here. Hopefully, maybe some news coming out down the road. You'll have to check back in with us. But until then, I just want to say thank you. I always appreciate talking to you and hearing what's going on. And I feel like getting that state of play about telehealth and uptake and how the, the buyers of telehealth technology has changed over the last you know, cu couple months or last years um, is really interesting. And so thank you so much for your perspective. Jessica, on that. thank you for making telehealth and everything we talked about look so cool. So, really appreciate every it's not, opportunity. It's not me, it's your war analogies. I feel no, like you, no. you sell it pretty well. No. We all know all right. the truth here. Right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Roy. Everybody, that's Roy Schoenberg. He is the co CEO and president of Amwell. I'm Jessica DeMassa. And for more interviews with the people who are changing the way that we do healthcare, please check out my YouTube channel over there at youtube.com/slash WTF Health. Thanks again, Roy. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Jessica. Good seeing everyone.